to be here. Um, so um, uh, what, what, when I uh, when Telesan asked me to do this, I first prepared something very technical. Uh, I didn't realize at the time how diverse the audience is, uh, but now seeing the diversity of the uh, background of the audience, I decided to give up on my original plan. Instead, I will talk about something that's just common sense in the research field that I, that I work in. But I think it's rather interesting and uh, somewhat uh, deep as well. So, um, um, so basically, in the last decade or two decades, at the intersection between quantum information science and quantum matter physics, uh, there was this new idea of uh, uh, entanglement entropy and tensor networks. Um, so the entanglement entropy um, is defined on quantum state. So here, for example, it's a two-dimensional lattice where uh, it's six by six. Uh, you can imagine that on each of these uh, uh, sites, there is a local Hilbert space. So basically for this guy, the entire Hilbert space would then be uh, the local, the dimension of the local Hilbert space um, tensor to 36. So this is the, the entire Hilbert space of this system. And then you can say, well, suppose that I'm only interested in, a, in the properties of a subsystem of this pure state. Say that uh, only, only this part. This power. Um, and if that's the case, then of course you can form the reduced density matrix uh, of this uh, thick spin. Uh, and then in that case, the row will be, uh, so let's call this uh, i. Everything other than this uh, s. So basically, you would have uh, a essentially a linear operator that acts on this six spins, and um, 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 and it's a linear operator. And then you can define a quantity which is uh, its entropy, and that's defined as a uh, log of first row. Log row, no. uh, and then basically um, it's um, it is, it's it's this quantity. So um, this S roughly determines measures how entangled the subsystem A is with the rest of the system. Now the system has six spins, and the rest of the system has thirty spins. Uh, the most um, important example of such entanglement is a bell pair between just two spins. You can have uh, a two spins, spin one, spin two, spin one, spin two, uh, that's just in this particular state. And then you can say, what's the, entang uh, the entanglement? What's the reduced density matrix of the first spin? So you have to partially trace away the second spin. And then you discover that it's basically the identity, identity matrix divided by two, which is the mention of the first uh, Spin silver space. Uh, and in that sense, it's like maximally entangled. It's maximally entangled because uh, the entropy um, is it, because the entropy of a density matrix that's two dimension uh, can at most be log two. So basically, uh, this will have an S of log two. And that's the largest it can be. So in this case, the bell state. Is maximally entangled. Well, it's something rather interesting, which is that um, um, entropy measures information. Of course, there's no conservation law of information. Gossip spreads. Uh, I can know it, and you can know it. There's no limit of how much information contained in a particular system. Uh, on the contrary, there is conservation energy. So um, you might then expect, well, is there sense that somehow the entropy can be minimized or, or maximized for a particular physical state. That's all that there is, even though there isn't a straightway conservation law. And it's best illustrated by the fact that suppose you have this system, two of the spins 
from a bell curve, which is maximal. Then you can show that these two systems cannot be sampled with anything else in the system. So basically, entropy in a sense is if you share it too much with a particular neighbor, then like that's it. You cannot share it with anyone else um, anymore. So in that sense, there is a limitation to which how much entropy you can have within a system. And then rather remarkably, this limit is realized for ground state many body systems in a very particular way. So this way, um, in a very particular way. Generically, entropy um, is obviously a notion that we see very much in thermodynamics. And we talk about the density of, an, of, a, of, a, of, a, of, a, of entropy of a particular system. And whenever we can talk about it, the density of some thermodynamic variable, we know that that's proportional to the system size. So basically, suppose that small s is the large s divided by the system size, which is n number of system size. As soon as you can do something like this, which is density, uh, then we know that entropy is basically proportional to the system size. Uh, and uh, so it's proportional to the volume. And that's what we call, we have a volume law of particular quantity. That is, um, this quantity you can define for a large number of degrees of freedom in a system. And somehow that for that system, that quantity is proportional to its volume. And that happens generically in the sense that at high temperature, we see things around us. They all obey thermodynamics, and there is a well defined non zero positive entropy density. Turns out that that's not true for ground state in many body systems anymore. Uh, that's what people mean by the area law of entanglement entropy in the ground state of, uh, uh, of a um, many body system. So, in that sense, what I, what I mean by area law, I mean the following, which is suppose that you, in this system, you carve out a region, which is like this much. Then basically, the perimeter of the boundary between the system and the environment, the size of that is called the area. So basically, you can call, carve out a subregion of the system. And then turns out that that system's entanglement entropy is proportional to the length of this firm function. That's called the area law of entanglement entropy. This is rather generic. It's a remarkable fact um, of ground state of local um, Hamiltonian. Uh, and because of that, and that, uh, and so because, because of that, people came up with a wave function on that that uh, supports this property uh, that is, in a sense, good for estimate for um, approximating the ground state wave function for a particular many body system. And that's the tensor network on that. So it's basically based on the idea that we realize well, there's something rather special about the ground state uh, of a particular, of a generic Hamiltonian. Um, which is if entropy has area law, entropy is really, really small, has, is very, very little compared to the volume law. Uh, and because of that, so we came up with this idea of tensor network on that. So what is the tensor network on that? Tensor network on that is the following. Um, so I'll explain perhaps in one dimension first, and that's the easiest. Basically, suppose in this one dimension, you, the, first, the first thing you should ask is, well, what's the area law in one dimension? So suppose that I'm just interested in this two spins here. And then the boundary between the system and its environment is always just two points. So uh, that's always a constant. So, the so basically, the entanglement entropy of some region in one dimension is always constant. Doesn't matter how large. Um, the system is you can you can be interested in two spins, three spins, four spins. Uh, the area is always just be these two um, uh, intersections, and that's a constant. So its entropy doesn't grow. So that's a generic fact for ground state one-dimensional systems. Now, 
uh, so people basically just wrote down this particular enzyme, which is, um, so now I'm representing this as a lattice. I also represent this as a wave function, as an element. I say, I basically assign each of the vertex matrix, which can be different in general. Well, it's actually a tensor, it's got three dimensions, left, right, and the physical dimension. And uh, whenever you have, uh, say that this is A1 and A2, whenever you have a bump here and a bump here that's contracted, that's drawn together, we say that that's a contraction. What that means is that, suppose that this is L R, this L prime, R prime. Whenever that happens, that means that there is a sum um, in the tensor multiplication, which is L1, L, R, L prime, R prime, uh, that involves the delta between R and L prime, and then sums over. So uh, it's a summation over uh, these indices. So basically, there's a contraction here, 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 here. Um, and that is the uh, basically the thermal dynamic. This is basically that's the answer the wave, the wave function. Uh, maybe I should write it better. So basically, whenever I so if I fix if I fix the value of the physical index to a particular s, where s now is a vector, if I fix a particular value, not a or just literally matrices, each of it has two legs, and then I just Matrix multiply them all together. Where, of course, in the definition matrix, matrix multiplication, there's contraction here all implied. So just multiply them together. A1, A2, all the way to A6, S1, S2, and uh, S6. So basically, sum over all the possible configuration of the, in the in a particular basis of this large upper space. And then you say that the wave function, the coefficient of a particular um, um, basis element is the multiplication of this uh, matrix. That's why this thing is called matrix product state, because it's about it's product matrices. Um, so we, we write it now. Well, what's the promise? The promise is that the, the reduced density matrix of the system is like area law entanglement. Now I'm going to show why that's the case. Uh, I'm presumably. Uh, so now suppose that I'm interested in um, the reduced density matrix of these two things. And then, of course, I want to compute its reduced density matrix. Uh, so that row, let me call this A and B. So A and B. The particle trace over all the spins that's not a, that's not b, the wave function. The partial trace would mean that uh, you contract this physical. So first of all, you have two copies of this uh, matrix point on the table. The partial trace, not a and not b, and then there. So this will represent the cat, and this will represent the bra. And the contraction, so this is A and B. The contraction uh, of spins that's not A and B would mean you would just multiply these things together, these indices together. Uh, now you see that it's basically a wave function, it's basically a density matrix. Uh, Um, where this R represents, you can imagine that this is very large. So it contracts all the way from very far away, right, all the way to this point. Uh, but everything that, everything that the environment on the right contributes is just a single matrix here. And then that's the same for, for the left. The key thing is that the dimension of this index 
That's called time. Uh, doesn't depend on the system size. That's the whole point. So basically, you have a dense, you have, you have a you have a matrix. Um, that's like so. This matrix would be. Um, will be something like this. And it actually doesn't matter how large uh, the Hilbert space here and here is. What matters is that this is that the dimension of this index, which that's quite high, doesn't depend on the system size and doesn't depend on the system, the size of the system that you're, in, you're interested in. Then I say that that's obviously just uh, Matrix, two matrices multiplied together. That's called A and B, and one and two. Or this is M one, then this is M two. The point is that this M one is what is basically B to the number of spins you're interested in times chi squared multiplied by a matrix as chi squared times D to the number of matrices, D to the detailed number of spins that you're interested in. Um, then it's just the fact that the rank of this matrix, the rank, the rank of two matrices that's multiplied together uh, is less than the minimum of the rank M1 and the rank M2. But M1 and M2 have a finite rank because this number can be large. So that's the number of spins in the system that you're interested in. But this has a finite bound dimension. So that was chi, chi square, and this is also chi square. So both M1 and M2 are in a sense low rank. They have a finite rank that doesn't depend on the system size. That means that this density matrix. Uh, has a rank that doesn't depend on the system size either. Doesn't depend on the size of the system, doesn't depend on the size of the environment. Uh, so that's why it's entanglement entropy is a constant that doesn't scale with the system size. So that's the manifestation of the area law entanglements in one dimension. In matrix products there. Um, I think that perhaps, perhaps let me sort of just stop here by saying that. What the general strategy is, the general the general strategy has been, well, of course you can always do exact diagonalization, but that's very expensive. Is that suppose you're interested in a particular state, then you want to approximate ground state, you want to approximate its wave function. Uh, the hope is that you can recognize some entanglement properties of the target state, and then you know something about it, and then you construct the ansatz. Uh, that captures that entanglement property. And if that's the case, then hopefully you can approximate the state well. And then it just turns out that the barrier to classical simulation of quantum antibody systems um, has everything in the entanglement of subsystems. And the matrix product state um, is simple in the sense it has low entanglements. And then just fortunately that in ground state in 1D, uh, that's also the case. Uh, so you can generalize this from one to two D. Won't go into the details of it. Yeah, but um, I think that's all I want to say, or maybe for yeah for this introductory talk. Okay, thank you very much, Yanta, for very pedagogical and clear uh, talk. So, is there any question or comment? Question. Question. Yes, uh, go ahead. Oh, oh. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So, uh, so a ground state you say it's a uh, area row, yeah. but uh, at high temperature, for example, I mean the entropy would go to the volume low. Yes, exactly. How does this transition happen in terms of this tensor network? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's sort of the point, which is, um, so first of all, if you go to higher temperature, uh, it's not a pure state anymore. So you do not represent this uh, as a pure state anymore. But you represent it as a density matrix. And that, that density matrix turns out that you can represent with tensor networks as well. 
but there uh, it's not the entanglement entropy that matters anymore. Uh -huh. Yeah, so it's basically, so there, there are two strategies. One strategy is that for any quantum system you give me a, a, a mixed state, uh, that's not a pure state, I can always purify it so that it's a state, the larger pure state, whose partial trace is the density matrix that you give me. And then you can ask me, well, can I represent that large pure state? Turns out that in many cases that's possible. So that's one way of simulating um, systems in a finite temperature, basically to do this purification game. Uh, to do this purification game. The second game, the second strategy is to use state operator, um, they call this isomorphism. So basically, you can view any operator, in this case, it's the density matrix, uh, it's the density operator at finite temperature as a state because you basically view the row index and the column index of the density matrix both as the physical index. And then you can represent that uh, as a pure state. And turns out that that's also, that also works. But of course, in that case, the entanglement entropy is no longer the naive entropy that you speak of because of this isomorphism. Uh -huh. So basically, there are strategies to do uh, finite temperature calculations uh, using this on the. There's a third one which I will mention. Yeah. So you, you still be able to uh, yes. describe finite temperature system for with, with something like this. Uh -huh. But, but uh, it's, yeah, it's not, yeah, it's not no longer pure state. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. uh, just my question. So that, so this uh, the, the area law. So this entanglement entropy is constant in one D. But then, if you go higher, yes. this is just only the property of one D. And if you go higher dimension, it is it is. So the area law still works. Like yeah, the area law still works. So that's rather. Okay, then it, uh, the the actually it increases um, proportional uh, uh, proportion to the uh the area area. Yeah. 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 Sub subsystem Yes, yes, exactly. And it, that, it applies to any dimension. That applies to any dimension. Uh -huh. Yes, exactly. So that's the whole point. So basically, in one D, you have a similar on that uh, that that app, that upholds the same philosophy as in one D, but it's no longer a matrix product space anymore because the connectivity is no longer just two by four. Uh, and turns out that this area law is actually even stricter in 2D. So you can ask, oh, it's interesting. So let me just say this a bit more. You can, you can ask me, well, is there any pure state that's the ground state of in one dimension system that's not an area law? It turns out that is. And generically, so these are ground states of uh, critical, spin, critical systems. So it's described typically by a massless field theory. It's correlation length is infinite. And in that case, you can prove, um, if it's described by a conformal field theory that uh, its entanglement entropy doesn't have an error law anymore, but grows with the system size, but only log arithmetic. So the, an area law, a volume law would be S to L. So L is this, basically this is L. So this is volume law state. Uh, sometimes you can have, this kind of scaling. Uh, and then that's one dimensional critical state that's in 1D. Uh, D over three, let's say. So see the, see the central chart of conformal field theory. Turns out that in 2D, obviously, you can ask me the same question. Well, what if you have a gapless uh, Hamiltonian? What if it's the critical I think, um, transverse field I think model in two dimensions? In that case, it turns out it's actually much less severe in this case, which is as still, um, let's call this air, let's, let's call this the boundary of the system. Uh, you would imagine that something plus um, log of admit correction, but this is only additive, so it's very mild. The most severe case that we know that the ground state that violates uh, the area law um, in 2D is actually in the presence of the Fermi surface, so basically in any, any atom. Then this, multiple, then this additive correction becomes multiple. 
and that's much here. So it's a yes, it's a boundary log one. Uh, yes. So um, basically, that's what yeah. So people have studied in <laughs> extruding in excruciating detail what happens in two D, and typically for um, especially two dimensional free fermions, people know quite a bit. Uh -huh. Okay, thank you very much uh, for interesting question. Yeah. Yes, go ahead. So, so the black hole entropy is also a uh, entanglement entropy. I mean, uh, is there any connection of this uh, surface? I mean, I mean, black hole entropy is yes. surface area. Is it related to some somehow to this notion? Yes. Yes. Okay. How? Uh, I mean, uh, is trivial consequence of this or? Uh, so basically, you're asking about the black hole in general relativity. Yeah. Yeah. So the black hole of general relativity, obviously, that uh, so that's proportional to the area of the horizon. Uh huh. Um. There, of course, I don't know black hole physics, but just from my listening to other talks, it seems that the degrees of freedom that couple between inside black hole and outside black hole only happens on the boundary. So, for example, um, if you have suppose yeah, this is your entire system, and then this is the horizon of the black hole. If the degrees of freedom that couples between the inside the black hole and outside black hole only resides on the boundary, then that's an error. Uh, but yeah, it turns out that, that was, that's what happens in black hole. If it's more severe, like a volume, like a random state, finite temperature state, then you would have long range entanglement in the sense that you can have a spin here that couples as far away of the environment, or maybe just here of the same strength. And that would give an error, a volume. And that's, uh, that would violate the. Uh -huh. Yeah. Okay, let, let, let me comment on that. So, so in the uh, gravity and the uh, string community, uh, it is, it, it's been known that if that uh, uh, the mysterious area of the black hole entropy can be understood uh, very uh, reasonably by if it's uh, uh, entanglement entropy. But uh, the difference here is we don't know what's inside the black hole, uh, the, the exact uh, on, on, in the case of the spin systems, uh, the, you, you know that all the quantum systems are um, microcanonically, but we don't know the inside of the black hole, what's going on. And so that's uh, many works, including the one of the Yoko Kurek-san's work, others, so it's debatable. So that question is that uh, perhaps the answer to the Hadassan questions, we don't know, it's, uh, we, we suspect that it is the case, but uh, we don't know. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. Okay, any other questions? If not, uh, let's thank Yantao again for a very interesting talk and also the library discussion. Thank you very much.